Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Bava Metziah Daf Pezayin. It's the Daf for Shabbat. We're going to continue with our Drashot that we started about Abraham when the angels come to visit. And we'll go from there. We're going to learn some very famous statements, um, particularly one in the very beginning of class that you've probably learned when you were little. And we'll see where are the source is. So we're going to start with the bond of Av Pev Ava Mubeh. Last line. When the angels came to visit Abraham, he said to, they said to him, yes, we're going to do exactly as you said. When he said, you know, I want you to come in. And they said, yes, sure, no problem. But when it came to Lot, but Lot had to encourage them. They didn't want to stay with Lot when, they, when the angels came to Lot's house. From here, we learned an important lesson that you can refuse something when it's someone not important, but when it's someone very important, you don't refuse. First, Abraham said, I'm going to go get bread. And then he immediately goes and runs to the animals. So what do you learn from this? Here comes the famous line. Righteous people say very little, but do a lot. Right? They don't say, I'm going to do a lot. And then they, they come back and they've already done a lot of things. But but Rishayim, bad people, they say, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do that. And then they don't even do a little bit. Okay? So where are we going to learn this? Right? The, you what was that to make it seem like you're going to do big, great things, but if you don't follow through, then obviously there's no meaning. And if you are going to do great things, don't go bragging about it and say, oh, I'm going to do so much. No, say you're going to do a little and then do a lot. So now what happened with Ephraim? Remember Ephraim sells a field, the burial plot to Avram. Me karktiv, Eretz Abraham el Shekel Kesef. Really, you need the continuation, which is he said to him, Eretz Abraham el Shekel Kesef, I don't really care about the money. That's not what's important. Right? What's 400 checkup between you and me? And makes it seem like he doesn't even really care if Avram pays him. And then, but in the end, it says, Avraham he listened to Ephraim, but he called Avraham to Ephraim and to Kesef, asher diber bo's neighbor nechet. So Avraham gave Ephraim the money that he told the, the sons of Chet. Arba me'ot shekel kesef over la sochir. Now notice here, it doesn't say Arba me'ot shekel kesef, like it said before, which which Ephraim didn't even say, said even, I don't really care about. But it says, 400 shekel over la sochir. That means shekels that can be, that can be sold easily. So why did it add over la sochir? From there, the drasha is de lo shakal mine ela kintere. That really, in the end, Avram had to pay four hundred shekel kesef. It wasn't shekels, but kintere. Now, what are kintere? Rashi says kintere are a hundred mane. Now, hundred mana are a hundred of a hundred zuzim. A mane is a hundred zuz. So, a hundred times a hundred is ten thousand zuz. Which in shkalim, remember, a shekel in the Torah is a sela. There's there's uh, four zoos to a sela. So 10,000 zuzim are 2,500 shkalim. Now that's just for one kintara. One kintara was 2,500 shkalim. Avram had to pay him 400 of those. Do the math, you get to a million zuzim. Okay, that's a lot of, sorry, a million shkalim. That's a lot of money. Okay, so basically... Abraham, in the end, in other words, what happened was Ephraim, in the end, made him pay all this money. So, just one second. Um, yeah. So now, um, how did Ephraim get away with this at all? Okay. Besides that, he said, I don't really care, and then obviously did. But, there are places that call it a shekel, a kintara, or some people actually have the opposite gears that call a kintara a shekel, which makes more sense. And because you could call a kintara a shekel, Ephraim claimed, oh, that's what I meant when I said shekel, I meant that. And this is all darshan from the extra word. Uh, the extra words, over la sochel, can be sold easily in the shuk, obviously more money, right? It's obviously more valuable in the shuk. And that's, that's what we get from. The comparison, essentially, before we compared Avram and Lot, now we're comparing Avraham to Ephraim. Ktiv, Kemach, Uchtiv, Solet. Now, when it comes to Avram, what happened? He said, 
Ve'ela bakarat Abraham. Sorry, not the pasuk. Ve'imher Abraham awahela el safa. So he goes to Sarah and he says to her, Mahali shlosh se'im kemach solet. Go get three se'im of kemach solet. Now kemach solet is a little bit weird because kemach is kemach and solet, kemach is regular flour and solet is fine flour. So what does it mean get three se'av of kemach solet? So the Gemara is going to darsh in this. This is a, an interesting line. They say that women are more stingy with the food than the men. And because of that, he told her, okay, so now because of that, what? It's a good question. And there's a deliberation about how to say this. So Kemach and Solid are two different things. Solid is worth a lot more. So what do we learn from this? That he said Kemach, sorry, she said Kemach, and he said Solid. And that's why it says Kemach and Solid. She wanted to do the cheaper option. And he said, no, 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 go with the Solid. Okay, first of all, one could come up with all sorts of reasons, especially in those days, while women might be more stingy with the food. Some people might claim because the men make the money, so they're able to more control, right, in those days, particularly the men were the ones who made the money, so they are more willing to say, oh, I don't mind spending my money on this, whereas the women didn't make the money, so they were very stingy about it. Um, you could say the women worry more about the children and what's going to be. Um, anyway, it's an interesting theory. What I also thought was interesting is that the way the, the, the way to interpret this, and there's a few different ways. One is to say, he said, she said Kemach, he said Solit. The other option is actually to say, which was, I thought, also creative. Most women are stingy with their money. That's why Avram first said Kemach. And then Sarah said, Oh, no, let's do Solet. And what he was trying to show is that Sarah was greater than the other women because she wasn't stingy, but yet thought it was important to, to do that. Um, just want to see one thing. Let me make sure I got that other interpretation right. Okay, so I don't remember where it is, but right. some people say that he said to bring the camera and then... Right. And then Adushan Rahim Kemach. Right. And then he said Kemach, but she, right, she went beyond. Okay, I said it right. So it's either he told her, she said one, and he said, no, 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 give more. Or he said the lower because he thought because she's a woman, she's not going to want to, but she actually went beyond and said, no, no, no. I think it's important to bring Sola. Next Russia. So he tells her, go make ugo, which is bread. And then it says, he took butter and milk and from, you know, halav uh, uben bakar and an animal. So we're not going to talk about basar bakalav here, but ilu lechem lo aite kamayu. But the issue was there wasn't any bread. Amar Ephraim Mishka'a, tell me, in other words, what happened to the bread? He said, go make bread. In the end, when he brings them food, he doesn't bring them bread, or it doesn't say he brought them bread. It could be it was just obvious and didn't need saying, but the Gemara wants a darshan. So what do they claim? Abraham Mikshah, tell me, dosha Rabbi Meir, which made Rabbi Meir. Okay, he, this student, Ephraim Mikshah, passes down the name of Rabbi Meir, who was a student of Rabbi Meir. Abraham Avinu Ochil Chulim Betarahaya. He was very careful, and this is something you see, right? This is a way of, of saying what the rabbis are doing today in the time of the Gemara, was something that Avram Avinu also did. The whole famous is the fact that he did an Erev Tavshilin, um, and that he kept those mitzvot Durabanan come from also this story. So here again, we have this, Avram did what the Prushim did, which is they ate their food with as if they were hektish, even though they weren't, and it's uh, treating them as sanctified, even though they weren't sanctified, and made sure always to be pure. And that if anything got impure, he wouldn't eat it. So what happened, obviously? He told Sarah to make bread. And Sarah made no toy on Pirsani dash. She must have had her period. And therefore, she got the food impure. Now, it's interesting, Bichlal, if you think about the story, right? They're coming to tell Sarah she's going to have a child. And it, there's obviously a connection here between the fact that she started menstruating on the day that they came. Kind of her body was already preparing for what was going to be. Of course, you have to wonder about the story because then Sarai says, "What I'm, Sarai says, I'm going to have a son. What? I'm too old. But if she already got a period, then how could she claim she was too old? Anyway, interesting, uh, whole interesting drasha here. 
Again, uh, if we just go back for a minute, I want to stop. These stories aren't necessarily meant to say this is exactly how it happened, right? But they're trying to impart some sort of message. And the message here being, number one, first of all, maybe there were already signs that Sarah should have understood already that something was going on here. And also that it's a support, the rabbis are trying to support what they're doing by showing some source for it way back when. Okay, that's the really more important message they're trying to get at here, even if, you know, it's probably unlikely Abraham ate all of his kulim b'tahara, but the rabbis want to say, oh, look, here's a here's an indicator. This is what they did. Now, why do they say oil? Oil is always a, a place of sexual relations. That's where it takes place in the tent. It's a very private place between husband and wife. So why did Abraham say she's in the oil? So first they want to say she was in the OL. Sorry, we're going to get to the part about the the um right about the the connection of the OL being the place where sexual intercourse happens. But right now they're going to say it just shows that she was snua that while they came she was in her OL. That's the first method. So why did they say One second. Right. And then he said, They knew that Avraham was going to answer Ohel. But what did they want? They wanted him to think about how much he loves his wife. So he had him repeat that, oh, she's in the Ohel, which is the place of intimacy. And that's a way of kind of getting Abraham to think about his wife. Rabbi Yassi, Rabbi Hanina, Mar, Kedei the Shager la Kosha Bracha. They asked where she was, not because of that. They asked where she was because they wanted to give her a Kosha Bracha. They wanted to give her a, 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 a cup that was blessed. Tani Mishum Rabbi Yossi, Lama Nakud al Ayo Shebe'ela. The letters Aleph, Yud, and Vat. In the word elav, have dots on them. Why do they have dots on them? Dots are always some sort of indicator. That the, the proper thing to do when you go to someone's house, when you greet a man, is to ask, how is his wife? Okay, that's the appropriate thing to do. But didn't Shmuel say you're not supposed to ask how a woman's doing? It's not, it's not appropriate. They say, no, asking a husband, how's your wife? That's appropriate. I think about all this, this time Seth always meets with people and he said, oh yeah, they asked about you. Now, whether they were asking, they really are, were you know, curious about me and how I'm doing, or it's just, that's proper etiquette. You meet someone, you say, how's your wife? How's your family? How are your children? All that. So again, we're learning all these messages from the story, messages that we kind of, you know, some of them we've learned when we were children, um, whether we implement all the time, I don't know, and more Ma'at Vaser Bey, but things like asking about how's your wife, how's your family, how's your husband, that's something we just take for granted. It's part of etiquette. So what is this, right? That's when Sarah is saying, basically, I'm too old. There's no way I could still have a child. What happened here was after her skin already started you know, going bad, bly in Hebrew is is when your your house starts falling apart. You know, when her body was already falling apart, what happened? What's Edna? All of a sudden from Hitadena Basal, her skin came, became soft. And and all of a sudden the wrinkles that she had developed before went away. Okay, the the bly, which is the wrinkles, all of a sudden everything went away. It's like she had plastic surgery. Um and Khazari Ophilum Koman, she looked beautiful as when she was before. Um, okay, so now, right, it's, what's funny about this is this was Sarah's statement when she laughed. She said, what, I'm going to have it now, but, but what they're saying is it actually came true. In other words, almost like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy or not exactly, a, but, but, you know, we've seen this before, Kishkagayo, Semi Pia Shalit, usually in a negative way. Somebody said, oh, someone's going to die, and then they died. This seems to be the opposite. You know, she said something what that's going to happen, and actually, it really did happen. Ktiva Adoniza came, Uktiva Niza Kanti says, How could I have a child? My, my husband's so old. And then, when 
when the angels, when uh, God speaks to Avram and says, Lama Sarah? Why did Sarah laugh saying, Ha'af umnam eled va'anizakanti? Because she said, I am old, but she said, he's old. Okay, so that's, again, Sarah said two things, actually. She said, what, going to all of a sudden get young? And va'adonizakain, and Avraham is old. But that part, God didn't tell Avraham. And even the part about herself, she never really said an izakanti. Now, she didn't make reference to the fact that she was old, but basically God changed the words. Right? God didn't say exactly what she said, that, oh, and my husband's old. So Tanit Be'er of Yishmael, what do we learn from here? Gadol shalom shafilo ha-kadosh baruchu shinabo. Shinemar v'titzchak tzara b'tkirba v'gomer v'adoni zaken u'kti v'yom r'sham al-Abraham v'ani zakanti. The fact that God changes it, we see how important shalom bayit is. That God didn't want Abraham to know that Sarah had said, oh, my husband's so old. So he basically changed it a little in order, right? Even God is willing to, again, twist the truth a little, hide something in order to create peace between husband and wife. So there's another pasuk. It's in um, Brisha 21. And it says, right, who talked about Mimi Lel Abraham and Hinika Banim Sarah. Sarah nursed ch children. It's a little bit strange. Sarah only had one son. That's all we know about one child. How many sons did she nurse? I'm Rabbi Levi Otoy, Yom Shakamal Abraham at Yitzchak Beno, and the day that, that Yitzchak was no longer nursing. I made a big meal. We saw it. We actually see this in the Torah, but the rest of this we don't see. What happened at that meal? All these nations of the world came and people were saying, Have you ever seen something like this? This old couple brought this child, a Sufi Minashuk, that's someone who we don't know who their parents are, just found him in the Shuk, picked him up, abandoned child. And now we're calling them a son. What kind of craziness is this? You can imagine, right? Because this 90 and 100 year old couple, you know, it doesn't make any sense. They have children. And then they're making a big party to try to make everyone believe them. So what did Abraham do? He invited all the righteous people of the generation. And she invited all their wives. Again, it's as if like there's Gedole Hador in his time, right? Again, it's it's rewriting history in, with, in light of what we know today that, oh, there's great men of the generation. So she invited all the wives. And they all brought their children with them. But they didn't bring their nursemaids. And a miracle happened with Sarah. And her breasts opened like streams. And she nursed all of those children. And that's what it means, Hinika Banim Sarah, this big miracle, in order to make it clear that it was their child. But what's the problem? That only makes it clear about Sarah. It doesn't make it clear about Abraham. So they were still making fun and saying, fine, maybe she was 90, she could have a baby, even though that seems absurd. But again, it was proven because she could nurse. Avraham be shana you lead? What? Can Avraham, a hundred year old man, give birth? Have a child? Miyad ne not give birth, but have a child? Bear. Miyad ne pach lester panim shal Yitzchak v'nidmel Avraham. All of a sudden, Yitzchak looked identical to Avraham. Patchu kulam v'amru Avraham will lead Yitzchak. Now they're taking a pasuk out of context and not from the section. But when it says, Eli toldot Yitzchak, Ben Avraham, it says, these are the toldot of Yitzchak, the son of Avraham. Avra, right, these are going to be, we're going to tell the story of Yitzchak. Avraham will lead Yitzchak. It says, Avraham gave birth to Yitzchak. Now, something's weird about that. Besides, he's not the one who gives birth, but okay, we can say, yes, who will lead. That we have in the Torah men all the time. But it already said he's the son of Avraham. So why does it also need to say, Avraham will lead Yitzchak? It's the same thing in the same pasuk. So what do they say? Ah, that must be a quote from somewhere else. And it must be from that party when all the other nations said, ah, Abraham gave birth to Yitzchak. And then they all have recognition that this child was the child of Abraham, of, uh, Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham lo haya zikna. Okay, now we're going to talk about some interesting theory about the world. There wasn't such a thing as old until Abraham came along. Man dehava bai le mishdeh bahade Abraham, mishdeh bahade Yitzchak. 
of the Yitzchak, Mishteba Hade Avraham. What was the problem? Why do we need Zikna? Why do we need people to get old? Well, after this miracle happened, the Yitzchak looked identical to Avraham. We had a problem because Avraham and Yitzchak look the same. And people want to talk to Yitzchak, they went to Avraham. People want to talk to Avraham, they went to Yitzchak. People were confused all the time because they looked so alike. And there wasn't this idea, right? To you, it seems ridiculous. Of course, you know, people get older. But what they're saying is that concept didn't exist until this problem came about. So Avram asked for mercy. And here comes a funny thing. An age came. How do we know? Because it says, okay, This is after it says, um, right, actually, it's not connected to that, but okay. But anyway, it says Abraham got old. And now we learn that's the first time someone gets old in the Torah. And that's all, right? What, what's kind of ironic about it is Abraham begs for mercy. He says, I don't like that. Everyone's confusing me with Yitzchak. So God said, oh, well, you better watch what you ask for because he's the one who got the old age. And we all know how tough it is to age and get wrinkles and all that. And Abraham had to, right? He kind of asked for it. That's what's funny about the story. Ad Yaakov, if we're already talking about things like this, Ad Yaakov lo have a chulsha. People didn't get weak. Ad Yaakov vay rachame vahave chulsha. How do we know? Okay. In other words, there wasn't this idea of weakness. Shnemar vayomar li Yosef yinei avicha chole. Okay. And basically, Yosef says, um, sorry, they said to Yosef, your father is sick. So from here, and told them we didn't have sickness, basically. What does it mean? People were alive. And then they died. Avra Yaakov all of a sudden had this thing called sick. That means he started to get weak and it was a gradual process. Now, until Elisha, nobody got sick and got better. There was no such thing. You know, sometimes you're sick, you feel like I'm going to die, right? I've been I've been so sick sometimes where I just feel like I'll never get out of this, right? You, you know, you have a stomach virus that's so, you know, it attacks your body. You just feel like, how am I ever going to get better? And in fact, in those days, they didn't get better. But when it came to Elisha, all of a sudden he got better. How do we know this? Right? Ate Elisha by Rachame Beitpach. He asked for mercy and he got better from sickness. How do we know this? It's kind of funny. We don't really know it directly, we know it indirectly. Shnemar Elisha Chala et Cholyo Asher Yamutbo. He then gets sick, this sickness that he's going to die from. That seems to imply Michlal de Chala Cholech It sounds like he had some other. Right, there was the sickness he was going to die from, as opposed to some other sickness which he wasn't going to die from. Tana Rabbanan Shlosha Chalaim Chalisha, and on this point there were three times he got sick. Echad Shedachapol LeGechazi B'Shtei Adav, Echad Shegiga LeDubim Batinokot, Echad Shemeipo. Okay, let's start with the last one. The last one was the one he got sick that he died from. Shnemar Velisha Chalal Tchayo Asher Yamutbo, and it just seemed the time had come for him to die, so he got sick and then he died, not for anything he did bad. But the other two times he got sick were punishments for things he had done. One was, if you remember the story with Naaman, he comes looking for a, a cure for his leprosy. Elisha helps him. He wants to give him gifts. Gehazi takes the gifts and takes them for himself. Right? Elisha says, I don't want gifts. And then Naaman gives it to Gehazi, his evid, his servant. And then Gehazi takes them. And and um, Elisha gets very angry at him and curses him that what, I, what happened to Naaman is going to happen to you and to your children after you. And, and basically it gives this huge curse. And it was it was too much. He pushed him with two yadayim. He could have just done with one and not with both. He didn't have to push him, you know, and punish him so terribly. And the other one is these children, this terrible story of these 42 children that were mocking him. And then they, they were calling him baldy, baldy. And then he curses them. And, and then they get eaten up. I think it's by lions, if I remember correctly. So... Both for those two things he did, where he had a very harsh reaction, he got punished and got sick for them. Ella, okay. Now that's the end of our section of these drashot, and now we're going to go back to the Gemara. Right. So then the 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 guy says to his son, "You promised them food, but but before they start working quickly, tell them it's I'm only giving you pot and kidney." Okay, legumes, bread, and legumes. Amale Ravacha bread Rav Yosef le Rav Chista. Pat kitnitnan o pat vikitnitan. Is it pat bread made out of legumes? Like you could have cornbread, for example, or is it bread and legumes? So Amale, so Rav Chista answers, Ha Elohim, 
uh, like that's a way of saying, I believe very strongly, this needs a vav like uh, a mordia needs for the livrot. Okay, what's a mordia and livrot? This is a, um, remember, right. It, Rashi says, mordia etz sherav achover manhig bo asfina. Okay, when you're in a boat, if you don't have this stick, you're going to get stuck on all these rocks. So they use the stick to make sure the boat doesn't get stuck on rocks. So they're saying, just like you need that stick, you can't function without it. Likewise here, you need the vav. It, it means pot, bread, and legumes, not bread made of legumes, and that's it. This is back to the Mishnah. No, you don't need to, you don't need, the son didn't need to go back and, and clarify. It basically goes by what the custom is in the land. Why do you say everything is according to Minhaga Medina? It must be including something additional. My arrangement is like one or two people in the city without specifying which people in the city. So Rabbi Yoshua says, we give them, the Balabayat has to give him like the, like the least of the people in the city. In other words, this also goes by custom of the city. If you say one or two, it could be you mean the one who makes the least amount of money. And because of the concept of if you want to take money out of my hands, you have to prove it. So if you, until you can prove it, then you basically have to give the lower amount to the worker. But the rabbis say, we try to make a compromise, okay? We do something in between the two workers or something like that. We prefer compromise than to, you know, letter of the law, and that's something we've seen a lot. Okay, moving on, Mishnah. If you're a worker, the Torah specifically says, and we're going to see the two psukim, so we'll read them in a minute. Um, the Torah says you're allowed to eat on the job. Question is, in what way, in what job, what kind of things are you allowed to eat? What are the limitations? Let's see. These are the people, so Elo Achlimena Torah, these are people who can eat by Torah law. Hausebim Mechubar Lakarka, Bishat Gabar Malacha, Ubitalush Menakarka, Ad Shaloni Gemara Malachto. Let's start with that and then we'll come back and we'll read the next part, which is if it's attached to the ground, you're allowed to eat when it's Gemar Malacha. Now, the Gemar Malacha, we're going to see in a minute so you don't get confused. Gemar Malacha for attached produce is different from Gemar Malacha for unattached produce or detached produce. So if it's attached to the ground, the Gemar Malacha is when you pick it. So when you're picking, that's when you're allowed to eat. Before the time of picking, you're not allowed to eat. But B'talush Menachark, if it's already detached from the ground, Ad Shaloni Gemar Malach it's until you finish the work. Now, what does it mean, finish the work? Well, if you're making um, bread, for example. So finishing the work is going to be once you have the dough. And it's what we're going to learn is gmar malacha is when it becomes obligated for trumona maschot, when you have to tithe it or bring the challah, for example, right? That's with the dough. So there it's the dough. With fig cakes, they say it's like when you like put the finishing touches on the fig cakes. It's different stages for different things. But if, until that point, when they're detached, you're allowed to eat them as long as you haven't gotten to that final stage. At that point, you can't start eating the stuff that people, um, that, you know, the it's that's the owner's stuff. <coughs> and something that grows from the ground. In other words, this isn't true for eggs, for milk, things like that. And this, these are the people who can't eat. And this goes back to discuss the other things we just discussed, which is, before the time of And if it's detached from the ground, then it's once it's a final product, you can't eat anymore. And it's okay, that, and things that don't grow from the ground. Again, we could have inferred all this from the first part of the Mishnah, but the Mishnah is spelling out both sides. Now our big question is going to be, where do we get this from? And we're going to have one of these long-winded drashot. Or long process of drashot. Not a long drashot, but a long process of how we're going to get there. 
This is the Pasuk in the Torah that we're going to see this Chupsukim. If you go to the vineyard of your friend and you eat, and then it's going to say, I'll read you the whole Pasuk because it's going to be important. And you can eat grapes as much as you want. I shouldn't say as much as you want. For your soul to be satiated. But what can't you do? You can't put it in a vessel. I'll already tell you there's another pasuk, which is the next pasuk. These are both in Dvarim Kaf Gimel. The next pasuk is Kitavo Bekamarecha. When you go to your field, not just a vineyard, you go to the field. And you and you pull thing, you can pull things with your hand. But you can't take your sickle and start, you know, taking quantities, you know, and cutting, harvesting in in, in big droves of stuff for yourself. Okay, so things you could do by hand, this also makes logical sense, right? You take a little by hand, totally fine. Don't take large quantities and with a with a utensil or don't start putting it into your vessel to carry home. No, like eat a few that you can eat on the go. So now the Gemara asks, Menani Mile, okay, it says, So first they just quote the vineyard pasuk. But that would only be a vineyard. How do you know you can learn from here to everything else? What typifies a kerem? Just like a kerem is, it grows from the ground. And when, right, until Gmar um, Malacha, you're allowed to eat, which we're going to see in a minute how we get this, or at the time of Gmar Malacha, you know, when you're harvesting, that's when you can eat, which again, we don't know where we get that from, but in a minute or a few minutes, we're going to see where we got that in the Pasuk. So then we learn anything that grows on the ground, when it's attached to the ground, when it's complete and you're picking them, you're allowed to eat some. So they want to learn it from Karen. Very simple. But not so simple. Because if you want to learn a Binyan Ahab, it has to be that there's nothing unique about this halacha. To which they say, what do you mean? There's this halacha that if you have these grapes that grow kind of instead of with a, a whole you know, the way of, the way grapes work is there's one stem and then from there branch out all these other um, stems and from there the branches grow. But uh, the grapes grow. But in Olalot, they grow like in a line and there aren't, it doesn't branch out. And that is a halacha. You have to leave that to the poor people. So if you have this halacha, this extra halacha that doesn't exist anywhere else, we buy grapes, then maybe you also have this special halacha you have to leave for your for your workers, but not necessarily anywhere else. To which they answer, oh, well, we have the next pasuk, which you already know, gamrina mikama. Okay, we learn from the standing grains, to which they say, maybe they didn't know this pasuk right off the top of their heads, kama gufa or they just want to tell us, kama gufa and where do we get that from? So we have that other pasuk, and there you have also karam, also kama. So karam, you might not have thought we could learn from there to anything else, but we have kama, and from there you can learn. To which I say, what do you mean? Kama also has its own unique halacha that might not apply everywhere. So maybe it's only for things that are growing that are of the five grains, not rice, millet, all those other things. To which they answer, umimai. Oh, before they even answer, they're going to say, how do we know kama even means standing grains that are grains and not other things? That's only things that are chayav and chala. So that we're going to prove right now, a side thing. And then we'll get back to our question. Well, then we're going to learn it. Karim has unique halacha and um, Kama has unique halacha and we can't necessarily learn from there to anything else. But right now we just want to prove how do we know that Kama is referring to things that are growing, that are grains, that are chayv and chal. When we mind to high Kama, Kama de mechayv b'chalahi, how do you know that? That it's specifically something that's chayv and chala? Dilma kol kama kama rachmana. Maybe it's anything that's standing, which could be rice, could be anything, could be trees that are standing with fruits on them. Atya kama kama, because it says kama here and it says kama elsewhere. Where is that? Tiv hacha kitavo b'kama reacha. Uch tiv hatam. When it comes to the korban omer that they would bring the day after Pesach, it says mehechil harmesh b'kama. So there you see kama, and here you see kama, and that's barley. The omer was brought from barley. That's one of the grains. And if you made bread with barley, you'd be chayav and chala. And that's how we learned the kama bayas is also chayav and chala. So now each one has its own unique halacha. 
And therefore, maybe you can't learn from there to other things, to which they use the typical bamehatzad, which is ikalamifrach. What do you mean? You could say, malakama, uh, uh, sorry, I skipped. Uh, right, matam kama, okay, sorry, ikalamifrach. You could knock this out because you could say, malakamash ken chayabe bechala, terem yochiach. Okay, so it's true, kama is the suni kalacha. That it's chayv and chala, but kerem, right? Grapes aren't chayv and chala, so kerem yochia. That's not the chumra, the stringency that causes us to have to take, um, to give to our 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 workers, let our workers eat, because kerem doesn't have that uniqueness, and yet you still have to. And mala kerem will do the reverse with the kerem. Mala kerem ken chayav alolot kemach tochia kamat tochia. So the kamat will prove that oh, the olalot isn't what causes us, like the fact that you're high to give that, the poor people doesn't necessarily mean that's the reason why you have to give your workers to eat because Hamad doesn't have that. And then we say, Chazar Adin, Lo right? So now we put it all back together. And this one doesn't look like that one. That one doesn't look like that one. Meaning, what's the unique common denominator, the least common denominator, thing that typifies both of them? From here, we can learn to everything else. Shekain davarshi gudule karka, it grows from the ground. And bishakamar malacha poel ochelbo, and which we haven't yet proven. I said it was going to be a few minutes. It's actually a few more minutes. We're still not there yet, but we're going to prove it soon, which is you can eat it. Um, you can eat it at kamar malacha. Av kol davar, right? Remember, when it's ready to be harvested. Av kol davarshi gudule karka, bishakamar malacha poel ochelbo. So from here, you can learn to everything else. That sounds great. But there's going to be a problem. What do you mean? There's another common denominator that isn't like everything else, which is, But wait, these are two things that can be brought on the altar. The the grains can be brought as uh, mincha offerings, and the wine can be brought as libations. So maybe it's just in these things that are unique and have some sort of special element about them, they can be brought on the altar. And we would then include one more thing. Also, olives would be included because there were also oil libation. So now they say, wait, okay, before we get back to our basic question, which is, well, then how do we learn to everything else, right? To all other foods that you're working in the fields, that grow in the ground, that your worker can eat. But before we get that, we're going to say, wait a minute. You don't need kerem and kama to teach you, right? The vine and the standing grains to teach you to zayit, you can learn it from somewhere else. Zayit, you can learn because zayit b'mehat tzadat. What you're going to learn zayit from the least common denominator between those two things. Who gufe kerem ikre? Zayit itself is called a vineyard in this following pasuk. Dichtiv. It's a it's a pasuk from Shoftim. Say for Shoftim. Vayav ermi gadish vaad kama vaad kerem zayit. And what do you see here? Zayit is called kerem, so it should just be included in kerem. You don't need to learn it from kerem and kama together. To which I'm a papa, kerem zayit, ikre, kerem stamalo ikre. We've seen this actually before. He says, no, no. It, kerem zayit, you could call a zayit, but a regular kerem does not include olives. Only if you call it a kerem zayit. So the word kerem in the Torah is not including olives, but yet between the kerem and the kama together, we would derive olives because they all have the same common denominators, including that they're brought on the altar. So we're back to square one. How do we learn it to everything else? Which is all we were trying to come up with. To which the answer, El Amr Shmuel, Amr Kra, Vichermesh. Because it says, okay, when you're, it said, El Kal Yecha Lo Titen, right, sorry, by the Kama, it said, Kama Reyecha, Vekatavta Malilo Piyadecha, right, you take it in your hand, Vichermesh Lo Tanifa Kama Reyecha, but don't use your sickle. What do they learn from here? This applies to anything where you use a sickle, which is most crops. So v'chermesh l'rabot kol ba'alei chermesh. So that would then include rice and things like that. So we're going to get back to the fact that what about trees? You wouldn't use a sickle for fruits on trees. So we're going to have a problem with that, about how they know you can eat trees. But right now, at least we got a lot more things included. To which the Gemara questions from a different element. Now we get to the whole idea of gvar malacha. And that's learned from chermesh. Because it says, right, don't put the sickle there. It must be when, though, are we talking about? When you would theoretically put a sickle. And when is that? During the harvest season, when the fruits are ready. That's when the whole halacha kicks in. And that we learn from Kermesh. So we can't learn from Kermesh to everything else. So now we're back to square one. 
But the Gemara rejects this question and says, what do you mean? No, really this halacha that we just said about how do we know it's during the time of Goran Malacha that you're allowed to, that your, your worker is allowed to eat and you have to allow your worker to eat is because it says, and don't put it in your vessels. In other words, do it by hand. Don't put it in your vessels when you're, when you're taking the grapes. From there, they learn it's a time when you're putting it in vessels. Put it in your owner's vessels, but don't put it in your own vessels. You can't take a basket of your own and collect all these fruits and take them home. So therefore, we learn Gemar Malacha from there. Hermes teaches us that workers, anyone who uses a sickle for anything, right, that, that's the kind of produce that you're allowed to, the worker is allowed to eat from and the owner can't prevent them from eating. So we've gotten close. But tinaf de bar chamesh, that only helps us if it's things you use a sickle with. De la bar chamesh minalan, like dates on a tree, for example. Ela amar rabbi yitzchak, amar krak kama lirabot kobale kama. So they reject the chamesh drasha, and they go back and they say kama means anything that's standing, including, I guess, a tree that's standing and has fruits on it. Okay, so then it would include anything like that. Bahamarta kama kama de machayv bechala. Didn't we say kama is coming to talk about a kama that you're chayv and chala? So they say, no, that was all, this is kind of a funny answer. That was before we had the drasha of Khermesh, which then said, this includes everything. So we now erase that issue of Kama being only things that are Chayv and Chala. Right? Once we had Khermesh, we already said this includes anything that you use the sickle for. Even though you're not Chayv and Chala. And therefore, Kama... Lamali, so what's Kama doing there? Lagabot Kobale Kaman. From the Khermesh and the Kama, we're now going to get anything that grows, basically. That again, you can't stop your worker from eating. Your worker's allowed to nosh, right? To take what they want. But wait, if all is drashoda from the Khermesh Kama Pasu, and theoretically you could get to grapes from there. So why is there a pasuk all about the grapes, the one we started with? Amarava Lihil Chotav. Ah, that's coming to teach you all sorts of other halachot. And here goes. Kiditanya, as it says in a bright time. Ki tavo ne'emal kam bi'av ne'emar lahalan lo tavo alav ha'shemesh. When it comes to paying your worker, these are all worker relations. Number one, let your worker eat. Also, lo tavo alav ha'shemesh means don't let night, don't let the, the sun set without having paid your worker. Ma lahalan b'po'el ha'katu m'daber, av kam b'po'el ha'katu m'daber. And that's coming to teach you that this whole section is talking about workers. Now, we took it for granted it was talking about your worker. But it never says worker in the Torah. It just says when you go into your friend's vineyard, you can eat whatever your hands can take. Could be just any random person could go into anybody's random vineyard and start eating. To which they say, ah, kitavo comes to teach you. No, only if you come like the kitavo, right? Well, there it's not the subject, but the topic, lo tavo lava shemesh, the sun shouldn't set. It's a totally different use of the word tavo, but because it's the same root, it means, right, we're learning from there, just like that's a worker. These are worker relations. These pasukim are talking about workers and how you have to treat your workers. Other drashan from that pasuk, bekerem re'echa kuti. In the kerem of a Gentile, your worker can actually eat even more. They can put it in there. If you're working in a, in a non-Jews field, you can take whatever you want, even in your basket. So, hani chalaman damar gezel kuti asur. Now, if you hold that you're not allowed to steal from a Gentile in general, this is telling you, but if you work for a Gentile, there's a unique halacha that you can actually do more. And that's why it says, in your friend's field, but a Gentile's field, you'll be able to take more. That's why That's why you need a pasuk to permit this poa, this worker. amar, right, to say, oh, if you're working for a Gentile, you can actually take, because generally, it's forbidden, it's theft, but this is not. But, but if you hold that you can steal from a Gentile, then so if stealing is okay, no, stealing is never really okay, but by Torah law, there's no, it's not forbidden to steal. So of course, it wouldn't be forbidden if you're a worker to take the fruits. So why we need even to have a Pasuk to teach you this? To which they answer, I'm sorry, I didn't read that right. You don't even need to tell us, Paul. And then they answer, They say, oh, no. It's a different drasha. It's And now it's going the reverse direction. 
if you're in your friend's field that you're working for them, you can take. But if it's a Hekish field, you're not allowed to take anything. So we have the Gentile, you can take even into your basket. The Jew, you could just take what you can by hand. But if it's a field of a, of a Hekdesh, you can't take anything. Other dress out of that pasuk. Um, uh, sorry, you can't suck out the juice. You can't drink, only eat. You can't, you can eat grapes, you can't suck out the juice and then throw out the dreads because that's called drinking. Now, usually drinking is included with eating, but why did it say v'achalta? It's an unnecessary pasuk uh, word. So they say it must be coming to say eat specifically and not drink. Anavim v'lo anavim v'davar achil. You can't take anavim and something else. You can only have anavim. Um, you can't take, right, they say you can't have grapes with salt, okay, or dip them in something. That's not a lie. Just eat them as they are. Kinafshecha. These are, again, these are all just words from the Pasuk. Remember, So your soul is like the soul of the owner. Everybody has a soul, right? The worker, the employer. Now, when you eat in someone's field, if, if I eat in my own field and I didn't yet, it wasn't yet obligated in true bona master. I can just eat if I want, as long as I don't take large quantities. But if I eat small amounts in the field, I can do that without taking, having to tie the produce. Likewise, you as a worker are like the owner in the sense that you can eat without having to tie the produce. You can't eat in a sickening way, eat way too much, gluttonous. This is already what we learned. This is the same thing, just a little bit more exp expressive. When you can eat in your neighbor's field, uh, sorry, when you're putting it into the basket of the balabayit, that's when you're allowed to eat it. You can't do it into your own, but it's the time when you're putting it in the vessels, that's when you're allowed to, to eat. Okay, with that, we'll finish for today. Quick review of what we did. We finished up all these rashot of Abraham comparing him to Lot, comparing him to Ephron, learning all sorts of other things about him and Sarah and learning about God and Shalom Bayit and how important it is to make Shalom Bayit. And we learned about the the how things started when the first person to get old was Avram. The first person to get sick was Yaakov, but Elisha was the first person to actually get sick and get better and showing how the world changes over time and the way the world changes. And, you know, in these cases, perhaps also Certainly with Avram, he kind of asked for old age because of the issue with him and Yitzhak looking the same, which again, as I said, was kind of ironic. Then we get to a worker being able to eat. And the main question we had, it's pretty easy to review, was basically, where do we learn it from that a worker can eat? We learn it from, again, a binyan ah between, um, we learn it from Karen. We, we actually, we in the end, we don't really learn from binyan ah from there. We learn it from the kama and the karmesh. And those two words seem to indicate everything that grows, and everything that's harvested with a with a sickle. And that's where we get to everything else. And then in the end, we had to say the Karen Pesach really doesn't teach you that halacha, but teaching you all sorts of details about the halacha that's during Gmar Malacha and who's right, your re'echa, not others. And we had all sorts of other dress out. From here, we'll finish for today. Wishing everybody a Shabbat Shalom and a Shavuot Tov.